I don't know. Have you ever uh, read a mystery that kept you guessing wrong until the very end? Well, today, uh, you want to keep your readers guessing the power of red herrings. And uh, with that, we're going to dive into the intriguing world of how to add red herrings in literature for your stories. But Thomas, why is it important? Understanding how to effectively use red herrings can transform your writing, adding layers of intrigue and complexity that captivate your readers. Hopefully. But what is a red herring? It's a bird. Duh. Okay. No. A red herring is a uh, narrative element that misleads or misdirects readers from important truths. It's like a magical, uh, a magician's sleight of hand, but in writing, where uh, you direct the audience's attention away to create surprise and suspense. All right. So before we get into the walkthrough, I always like to do some tips. So here's some tips when it comes to red herrings. Number one, effective use of red herrings. All right, the short of it, introduce red herrings through believable yet misleading clues. Embed them seamlessly into your narrative so they feel integral and not just added. I will add uh, this. Um... Poor red herrings would probably just be like something where you go, let's talk about this car over here a real a lot because I want people to think about this car. And then like it just turns out it's just a car, right? You want to be careful. You can do that, but you want to be careful with just being like, boom, here's a thing. Look at this thing. Hey, this. look at this. Look at this, right? So what is the long of it? Well, when it comes to the uh, effective use of red herrings, introduce clues that are detailed enough to seem relevant to the plot but lead to dead ends these should be plausible within the story's context making the misdirection more convincing and this is why you want to place red herrings around key events or turning points in your story this increases the likelihood that readers will latch onto them diverting their attention from the actual plot developments <laughs> The other thing is think about character motivations and actions. You know, you can use the actions and motivations of your characters to introduce red herrings. For example, a character might misinterpret a crucial piece of information, leading both the character and the reader down a false path that feels organic. Some of my favorite stories is the character. Uh, House does it. How in, in the show House, which is a play off of Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, House... Uh, sometimes gets it wrong, but we are led down the red herring. We are led down because he believes it, and we believe him because we trust in him. But ultimately, it ends up being wrong, uh, and then he figures it out, and, and, and you're like, oh, this is why we believe him, because you're allowed to make mistakes and not let it just destroy you. You know, like, it's okay to be to be wrong as long as you learn from it. But uh, when it comes to... Uh, um, red herrings you could also utilize the subplot you know you could weave red herrings into subplots that enrich the main story uh this integration helps them feel like a natural part of the narrator uh the narration rather than arbitrary additions meant only to deceive you don't want to just deceive your audience you want them to feel like oh you got me you got me you know what i'm saying they're in on the joke they get it Ah, oh, you got me how not to use red herrings? Well, the short of it, avoid overusing red herrings as they can frustrate readers if used excessively, uh, ensuring that uh, you know each red herring has a plausible explanation within the story's logic so they don't feel like mere tricks once revealed. You know, I would have got away with it if it wasn't for those pesky kids. Uh, you know, we get it. That's how the story's going to end. But if you did that every three seconds within the story, we'd be like, ah, I can't watch Scooby-Doo. The long of it is, while a few, uh, while a few well-placed red herrings can add excitement and mystery, overusing them can lead to reader frustration and fatigue. It's important to balance the number of red herrings to maintain pacing and interest without overwhelming the reader. This is because you want to maintain trust with your reader, and if you keep pulling the wool over their eyes, they will most likely put the book down because they can't trust what they're reading. You know, and by doing this, you ensure that your use of red herrings, uh, you know, 
basically doesn't stall the progression of the story. Each red herring should eventually contribute to the moving of the plot and getting it to go forward, even though it's a misdirection, right? Uh, red herring should still serve a purpose, right? And uh, when it comes to the red herring, red herring being revealed, it should come with a reasonable explanation that fits within the story's internal logic. This prevents the red herring from feeling like a cheap trick or a plot hole, uh, you know, but who doesn't like cheap trick? Great band. Provide closure for each red herring. Provide closure for each red herring. Resolving it in a way that satisfi satisfies the reader's curiosity and justifies its inclusion in your story, which will make it stronger. Uh, so what, what are things that you can't do? What I'm basically saying is don't overutilize the red herring. Uh, make sure the red herring has some sort of value to the main story. Uh, uh, the red herring has logical implications to the world and also that you resolve the red herring in a palpable way. Oh, what is the purpose of red herrings? That's a good question. The short of it, use red herrings to enhance the suspense and mystery, keeping readers engaged and guessing. You want to employ them to develop your characters, especially in showing how they deal with deception and destructions. Only the shadow knows. But what's the long of it? I have to say this. Skillfully placed red herrings keep readers engaged as they try to piece together the mystery themselves. Remember, it's all about discovery. You want readers to feel like they're discovering the world and the information. If they're in on the game, if they're getting to play it, even if they were misled, they feel good, you know? Uh, not all the time. Again, you want to keep that in mind. The reason is because this active engagement makes the narrative more compelling and interactive for the reader because effective red herrings lead to unexpected yet plausible twists, enhancing the story's overall impact and leaving a lasting impression on your readers. Now, you want to show how different characters react to misdirections, right? Because their responses can reveal hidden facets of their personalities or backstory, adding depth to the characterizations. Because remember, cause and effect something happens a lot of characters to react emotionally right because when you're writing a novel it's good to have the action on the page it's good to have the immersion on the page but you also need the perspective of the character on the page because they are being challenged their positions are being challenged in this situation their idea of what is the truth is being challenged and they are shown that it is not true that right this is not necessarily the truth of the reveal. Uh, the truth of the lie is revealed, but they have a truth, a position that they believe this piece of information is true to them, and then they are told that it is not true. So their position has been challenged. So now is it completely changed? Somewhat changed, or not changed at all? Completely changed means they're like, all right, I I accept that I was wrong. We got to figure out what's going on. Somewhat changes. They don't really believe it, but it's enough information to be like, all right, now I'm suspect about everything. Or not change at all. They double down. They're like, no, this is real. Okay. Allow characters to show reactions. Okay. You want that on the page. Um, because this also helps with the character's growth. You know, I'm just saying they learn from their mistakes uh, that are literally related to the red herrings. And in so, this creates growth and development because they completely change, somewhat change, or don't change at all. And even stagnant characters are growing in the sense they're standing strong to their conviction. And that is technically character development for you, the reader. You're developing uh, their character for the reader, you know? Okay. Okay. Uh, that's why it's also particularly effective if uh, in certain genres like mysteries or thrillers where uh, they're solving the puzzles because then the audience is like, oh, this is a smart character. I solved it too, but they solved it also. So I'm willing to trust and follow this character. Final tip, uh, examples of red herrings in uh, different genres. Red herrings have, oh, this is the short of it. Red herrings have versatility and can be adapted to different styles of storytelling. They are not just for thrillers or mysteries, even the traditional noir. The long of it. With that said, 
Here's a few ideas for your brain uh, to think a slightly different uh, about certain genres, starting with mystery to show you how red herrings are traditionally used. Classic whodunit. A suspicious character might be following the protagonist, but it turns out they're just a private investigator hired to protect them. That is a red herring. So if you've ever watched the movie and you're like, oh, the protagonist is being followed. Uh-oh. And then it just turns out they're a, detect they're a private investigator and they're actually trying to figure out what it is you're trying to figure out as well. And then they team up. There you go. Fantasy. In fantasy, a red herring might be a magical creature appears to be the villain, but it's actually a powerful ally in disguise. A seemingly cursed object is revealed to be a harmless magical artifact with a misunderstood purpose. So those are two examples of fantasy. One is the magical creature ends up being a hero in disguise, and then the other one is the object is useless. Science fiction. The first example might be a multifunctional robot. Eh, eh. Emergency, Mr. Roberts. And okay, uh, well, I was I lost that in space. All right, uh, multifunctional functioning robot seems to be on the rampage, but it's a desperate attempt to warn about a hidden danger. Okay, uh, a second idea for science fiction is the futuristic technology with mind controlling capabilities is suspected to be behind a series of crimes, but it's a cover up for a more mundane culprit. An example of um, the malfunctioning robot idea is uh, iRobot. They find the robot, and why did the guy? Well, why did the guy? Uh, 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 why did the robot kill his creator? And then you realize, oh, that's the red herring. It actually, it did do that to create the opportunity to help them realize that this robot's there to help them to stop the real, the real bad. In romance. You might see a love triangle that's introduced, making the reader question the true feelings of a character, but it's a misunderstanding and the real relationship blossoms elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Example of that might be, uh, let's go with the traditional, a woman likes uh, two different guys and uh, she's uh, pretty in pink as an example of this. It was originally supposed to end with her being with Ducky uh but molly ringwall was like no i want to end up with the uh other guy but um anyway so there you go uh you know that's a great example where she's she likes the musician and the the, uh, the famous guy uh, the, the popular guy in school and her best friend uh is a quote-unquote nerd like me and <laughs> dandy anyone um or whatever role-playing i love role-playing games i love role-playing games um but in the end if they end up with their best friend that's an example okay uh historical fiction you might uh, have a hidden message in an old document appears to be a treasure map but it leads to a historical truth instead uh, and how about a character suspected of treason is framed by someone manipulating historical events for their own gain all right so those are examples of uh of red herrings in different genres if you like what you've been uh watching so far and you're like this channel is uh pretty good i you know it's got me with the right mindset uh please like comment and share the video while hitting that subscribe button uh well subscribing and hitting the bell icon uh so you don't miss out all right let's do uh first four steps let's do it you want to do the first four steps all right, let's get let's get your brain going, everybody. All right. Do, do, do. Step one, establish the crime and the obvious suspect. Ooh. Okay. So we write down what the crime is. In this situation, it's a uh, a valuable scientist experience uh, experiment. Okay. Uh, let's say a prize winning orchard. Okay, goes missing from the classroom. Now we need to create the obvious suspect. It's going to be Billy. Damn, Billy. He's the class prankster, is known for being mischievous and has gotten into trouble before. We're going to say Billy has a history of being the punk. All right. Step two. We got to plant the red herring, you know, the misplaced tool. Okay. So. 
what we want to do here is we want to make readers or students suspect Billy. Okay. And here's how we can use the red herring. Uh, uh, one of the ways is uh, we place a clue near Billy's desk. We can leave a pair of muddy gardening gloves near Billy's desk. All right. Uh, this could be seen as a connection between Billy and the missing orchard, since it might need special care. Uh, uh, uh. All right. Step three, adding believabil believability to the red herring. This means that we have to give Billy a weak alibi. Billy claims he has uh, he was in the library during lunchtime when the orchid went missing. Billy don't go to the library. He's a punk. Anyway. However, you know, uh, the truth is that the library was on uh, the librarian was on a break and there are no witnesses to verify his alibi. So he might actually have been in the, li the library, but we cannot verify it okay which brings us to step four uh you want to hint at the red herrings uh explanation later right so here we go you want to show the janitor finding the muddy gloves later we can reveal that the janitor was using the gloves uh to repot a plant in the hallway completely unrelated to the orchid thief oh but thomas how it might play out. How it might play out. Here you go. Basically, uh, students will likely suspect Billy after finding the gloves near his desk, especially considering his past behavior and a uh, shaky alibi. This hopefully will lead them down the path of questioning Billy and may distract them from the real culprit. Okay, which brings us to remember. The key to a good uh, red herring is to make it believable, but ultimately irrelevant. It should point towards a seemingly logical conclusion that later gets debunked, leaving the mystery open-ended. And you're saying, Tom, but how does this work? All right. So the idea is that uh, what is missing? What is missing? The arch... The arch, the archid, the archid. What is missing? What is missing? I can't believe it's missing. The archid. All right. And then you want to say to yourself, well, who took it? Right? Billy. Okay. Why Billy? What is his motivation to take it? He has a history of being a punk. All right. Uh, what clues lead there? Glove near his desk. Right. And then ultimately uh, prove it. Uh, we can't because we can't check out his alibi. Alibi. All right. Now, <clears throat> if you're writing this, if you're writing your own story, you have to look at it in the same way almost. It doesn't have to be what's missing, but, you know, what is the red herring? So you might be like, what is the red herring? Okay. So you got to you gotta start somewhere and you just be like, you know what? Um, uh, uh, Eddie ain't. The lunch, uh, oh, eight. Uh, the protagonist's lunch at work. Okay, and now that's what's missing, right? This is what's missing. Okay, uh, you could also say, um, <clears throat> you know, Der Derek. Derek was uh, un unalived. Uh, and now Eric is. Uh, Derek is no longer alive. Therefore, he is missing, right? So what's missing? Derek, he is, he is unalive. Okay, so who took it? Well, Eddie is suspected. Suspected. If uh, Derek was unalived, who took it would be who did the deed. And we could say Eddie did the deed, right? And then uh, why? Because uh, what is uh, their motivation to take it? 
Okay, this is why did uh, Eddie take the lunch? Well, uh, let's say uh, no one likes Eddie. Okay, so that might also be like, why did Eddie on a live Derek? Uh, they didn't like each other. Okay, <clears throat> what clues lead? Uh, oh, lead them there lead them there all right <clears throat> now this is uh we could say um eddie never never jesus never brings his lunch in uh and uh there was the original lunch bag uh, in the garbage near him. Prove it. All right. And this is uh, we watch the video tape and learn that it was Dave, the manager. Oh, all right. So that's how we proved that the red herring. All right. But we have to say we can't prove it. So. We we watch the videotape and um, we see the top of someone's head that looks like Eddie, but we can't see their face. Okay. There you go. <clears throat> All right. So that's another example. By the way, this would be uh, we see Derek being uh, unalived, uh, but we only see the top of somebody's. Uh, head, so only their hair uh, in the frame of the video. Now, this is just the plot. So the story would be how we let it unfold. The story would be, you know, we'd have to, uh, boop. you'd have to build up uh, Eddie being, you know, disliked. Uh, so that would have to be a, we'd have to in a, every potential scene we can, we have to establish that Eddie is not liked. Okay. We also have to establish, establish Eddie not bringing in his food. Okay. So you have to establish that, but you also have to establish <clears throat> the manager always eating. Uh, food. All right. So you also have to see the the relevance to uh, the truth. So keep that in mind. Okay. Any questions? No, no hands. All right. Uh, here's a question for you. Uh, can you think of a book or movie where a red herring completely threw you off track? Share examples in the comments below. And by off track. I don't mean uh, you're Thomas the Train and you lost your footing on the track. If you found this video helpful or my jokes hysterical, please like, share, and subscribe uh, to the channel. And uh, please hit the bell icon so you don't miss out. Uh, final thoughts, as always. Strategic use of red herrings. Uh, you know, they are not just tricks or gimmicks. They are a strategic narrative tool that when used wisely can greatly enhance the depth and intrigue of your stories. They should be woven into the fabric of your narrative in a way that adds complexity and enriches the reader's experience. The truth is a well-placed red herring can add layers of complexity to your plot, making your story not only more engaging, but also more challenging and enjoyable to unravel. They prompt readers to think critically and engage deeply within the plot, analyzing characters' motivations and the reliability of the information presented. Now, the key to effectively using red herrings lies in their contribution to a satisfying resolution. They should build up expectations and lead to surprising yet coherent plot twists dun, 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 that resonate with the audience. 
Uh, this careful buildup and resolution ensure that your story remains compelling and memorable. While red herrings can significantly enrich a narrative, it's crucial to use them in moderation. Overuse can lead reader frustration and convoluted plot that is hard to follow. So you want to balance the use of red herrings with clear and direct plot developments to maintain good pace and keep the story accessible. More importantly, as a writer, always consider how each red herring will affect your reader's engagement with the story. More importantly, the narrative. Each misleading clue should purposefully lead your readers on a journey that, when resolved, offers them a greater appreciation of the narrative craft and a deeper connection to the story's unfolding. This is why I uh, I encourage you to, uh, you know, basically experiment with red herrings in your writing. Try integrating them into different genres and types of stories to see how they can enhance various narrative elements. With practice, you'll find the right balance and timing that makes your stories ju not just a reading, uh, but an experience, um, you know, something or other. But I will say this, uh, Game of Thrones Season 2... They get into uh, Tyrion uh, having having uh, having actually uh, hurt uh, Bran. Uh, that's the red herring. Everything, you know, the knife, everything is leading to Tyrion. And it turns out it wasn't Tyrion. It was most likely, spoiler alert, the prick, Joffrey. There you go. Also, uh... If anyone wants to play a drinking game, whenever I say uh, <laughs> uh, resonate, feel free. All right. Um, and by drinking, I mean uh, diet cherry Pepsi, though today I only have the diet Pepsi. I ran out of the diet cherry Pepsi. This was an emergency. Why do I drink the soda? It actually helps with uh, my neck pain, believe it or not. It, uh, it's a natural... Uh, the uh, the caffeine helps and helps. Anyway, next video on the series, book series versus companion novel. What is the difference and how do you approach it? Anyway, as always, keep developing the right mindset. Peace and harmony, truth and action. Until next time, love you, bye.